All right, then. I will call this meeting to order. This is the Nevada Senate uh, Committee on Judiciary. Today is March 30th, and um, I would ask the esteemed secretary to please call the roll. Vice Chair Conazaro. Here. Senator Orenshaw. Here. Senator Harris. Here. Senator Settlemeyer. Here. Senator Hansen. Here. Senator Pickard. Here. Chair Scheibel. Here. Thank you. And today we are joined by our illustrious staff from the Legislative Council Bureau. Patrick Guinan is with us, our policy analyst, as well as Nick Anthony, our committee counsel. And we have one bill on our agenda today. It is my bill. So I will be handing over the proverbial gavel, gavel to our Vice Chair, Majority Leader Canizaro. And thank you, Chair Scheibel. Um, we will go ahead and welcome the committee and everyone joining us virtually to the um, Committee on Judiciary. We have one bill on our agenda. It is Senate Bill 164 from our very own Chair uh, Scheibel. And we are going to go ahead and open up that hearing. Um, Chair Scheibel, we welcome you to the committee to present your Senate Bill 164. And you may begin when you are ready. Thank you so much. A good afternoon, a Senate Judiciary Committee. My name is Melanie Scheibel, and I'm the state senator representing District 9. Today, I am proud to present SB 164 to you alongside three co presenters. Stephanie Tucker is a licensed clinical mental health counselor treating survivors of human trafficking and is a member of the Sex Workers Alliance of Nevada. Caitlin Gwynn is also a leader with the Sex Workers Alliance of Nevada. And we're joined by Ross Armstrong from the Division of Family, Child and Family Services within the Department of Health and Human Services. SB 164 puts a dent in Nevada's human trafficking crisis by centering victims and focusing on services rather than arrest. To inform our conversation, I want to clearly articulate my perspective on both sex work and human trafficking, understanding that it is impossible for all of us in this state, probably even for all of us in this proverbial room, to agree. When I'm not here in Carson City, I pour my heart and soul into a job in law enforcement. I prosecute criminal cases ranging quite literally from traffic tickets to murders, and I work with hundreds of victims and their families. Speaking for myself and not for the office that employs me, in my work as a prosecutor, it is daunting and frustrating and heartbreaking to encounter larger than life systematic abuses of people like the human trafficking trade. Sometimes I encounter victims of human trafficking when they are being charged with misdemeanor crimes like soliciting prostitution or trespassing. Sometimes I encounter them when they are the witness in a case against the person who trafficked them. But most often I encounter them when they were charged with a minor drug offense or a theft related offense and their record was already several pages long with trespassing citations. Yet here they are in front of me uh, as a prosecutor with a court appointed attorney in front of a justice court justice of the peace or a district court judge in the 8th Judicial District of Nevada still trying to address a drug problem, unemployment and housing insecurity, even though they've already been to jail dozens of times on misdemeanor offenses. If I truly believed that rescue was arrest, I would not be before you today. I don't believe that we are rescuing anybody by arresting them. It's simply not been my experience. I think Ms. Turner will elucidate this point and some data specific to Nevada and some personal stories will also come out during testimony. While this has been my experience, I'm not afraid for reasonable minds to disagree. That's why I brought the bill forward in its original form to provide complete immunity to any victim of human trafficking for committing a crime under the duress of being trafficked. I understand that as written, the bill would provide an escape hatch for every person arrested on charges of soliciting prostitution to claim that they are a victim of human trafficking and be relieved of responsibility for crimes they've committed. I do not support allowing criminals to escape prosecution. The fundamental disagreement that, that you are going to encounter during this hearing is on whether there is a negative impact to not arresting people who are not victims of human trafficking but who are engaged in sex work. I've been committed to working with a broad coalition of stakeholders to find a policy that would both protect victims of human trafficking from arrest and prosecution while maintaining the tools necessary to prosecute pimps, traffickers, and panderers. A philosophical disagreement underpins this hearing, which you will hear from my partners in law, law enforcement. 
They'll oppose this bill because it hampers their ability to do their jobs in the way they've always done them. Law enforcement agencies, broadly speaking, wish to maintain the ability to arrest people who are committing crimes, such as prostitution and trespassing, as a means of connecting them with services and ultimately breaking the cycle of abuse. I have the utmost respect for these partners in law enforcement, and that is why I'm, that's why I'm committed to continuing to work with them to find an amendment to this bill that allows them to continue to work in this space and to be effective. We may never agree on that fundamental philosophical difference in opinion, but that doesn't mean that we can't all be partners and be part of the solution. And that's why I proposed the very substantial amendment that was provided to members of the committee by email and which is available for everyone following along on Nellis. When my partners in law enforcement expressed to me their concern that this bill would take away one of the tools in their tool belt without providing a meaningful alternative, I listened. And I want to be clear that it was always my hope and intention that the policy proposed in SB 164 would instigate the cultivation of resources that is now outlined in the amendment. In an ideal world, I would have brought forward a $20 million proposal to form the nation's largest anti-human trafficking task force that would provide housing, medical care, job training, and social services to every trafficked person in the state. But since we are still struggling to make a modest increase in the marriage license fees, which are the only source of state funding for organizations combating domestic and sexual violence, I could not propose such an expensive solution. I believe this amendment finds the middle ground that gives survivors hope that they will be able to come forward without fear of arrest, without hamstringing law enforcement agencies who will be forced to change their investigative models without sufficient guidance and structure. Now I'm gonna go through the sections of the bill and the amendment as read together to understand exactly what they do. Broadly speaking, the amendment puts the proposal that is contained in the current bill to set effect on January 1st of 2023. Um, it establishes a new position within the Department of Health and Human Services, who is responsible for creating a statewide plan to address human trafficking. The amendment is modeled after SB 293 of the 2019 legislative session, which you will hear about from Mr. Armstrong, which has worked very well. SB 293 of the 2019 session established the CSEC, the, uh, the Commission on the Study of Sexually Exploited Children and established a plan for addressing child sexual exploitation here in the state of Nevada. I am requesting that we implement a similar process for addressing human trafficking of adults too. So here's what the sections of the amendment do. Section one establishes the coordinator of services for victims of human trafficking. Section two specifies that the coordinator may be an employee of DHSS, a contractor, or employed by a partner organization. This is one of the sections I'm still working on with um, my partners and the other stakeholders to come up with the, the right structure for this position. Section three outlines the duties of the coordinator of services, which includes developing the statewide plan with stakeholders. And section four provides with more detail the requirements of the plan. I wanna point out an especially important part of the plan which is developing a tool for identifying victims of human trafficking and providing adequate education and utilization of the tool. The goal is actually to curtail the conversations in committees like ours about how we determine who is a victim and who is not a victim and instead hand it over to the experts in the field for them to tell us. Section five requires that the plan be submitted to the ACAJ and I remain committed to working with the stakeholders to determine who, if anyone, should be tasked with approving the plan. Part two, make changes to the language of the original bill, specifically with regards to the immunity afforded to, afforded to victims of trafficking. By changing section one, subse subsections one and three, the bill will specify that the immunity from arrest and immediate release from custody does not apply to felony crimes of violence as outlined in the habitual criminal statute, NRS 207.012. Adding the changes listed as three and four will allow for someone who is charged with a crime of violence to assert that they acted under duress as a trafficking victim as an affirmative defense and or as a mitigating factor at the time of sentencing. The change listed in that's listed as number five in the second part of the amendment will tie the two pieces together and say that we are going to put the plan into effect as the alternative to arrest and we are working with the, on the codification of that plan with stakeholders and experts to properly assess treat and identify victims of human trafficking. Um, I am very hopeful that I'll be able to earn your support of SB 164, as it has been a long process to get to the place where, where we're at with our amendment. As I mentioned early in my presentation, there are a wide range of people who are interested in this problem, all of whom come to it with their own perspectives, 
their own expertise and their own passion for addressing victims of human trafficking and for solving this problem. As I, as I outlined, I have a certain perspective on what I believe to be an effective solution. But of course, I am not the authority on this matter. And as the legislature, it is not only our privilege, but our job and our duty to come up with the solutions and to come up with a way to come up with the solutions. And in this case, we found a very good model in SB 293 from last year that I'm trying to recreate with SB 164 this year that sets forth the path for a group of qualified individuals to work together to come up with a plan that will, by 2023, allow for us to stop arresting victims of human trafficking and provide them with supportive services instead. In order to better understand the background of this bill, in order to understand why I believe that this is the best path forward, I would like you next to hear from Ms. Tucker, um, then Ms. Gwynn, and then Mr. Armstrong, who can elucidate some of these points. Ms. Tucker. Thank you, Ms. Tucker, you can go ahead and proceed. Hi there, um, my name is Stephanie Tucker. Um, I'm a licensed mental health counselor in the state of Nevada. Um, and um, Senator Scheibel is correct. I have, um, and, and I've, I've spoken with some of you um, about this in the 2019 session. Um, I have for a while been referred um, victims of trafficking. And um, for a while, I also was given uh, court mandated clients. Um, some of whom came to me um, because of their arrests for trafficking. Um, I wanted to share with you um, just a few things. Um, one is something uh, that, that has been brought up before, um, which is the psychological damage um, of arrest and raids. And um, there's a study that was submitted as evidence. Um, it's Ditmore 2009. And it's a study that shows that people that are um, arrested, specifically people that are arrested in raids, um, that basically they have psychological trauma from this. Um, it's longstanding. They have a uh, problems with mental health, trauma-related stressors, um, and that this is completely and totally preventable um, by just treating them like victims in this circumstance instead of arresting them. Um, there's also the problem of uh, deportation that comes with that, criminal records, difficulties with employment afterwards, um, very similar to Melanie. Um, some of my experiences um, sitting with people um, largely that they did something that was not their fault, something that they did not have control over, and that the end result was that their lives were complete collateral damage. Um, some of them lost their children. Um, some of them had difficulties finding housing after um, having arrest records, especially having something like solicitation of prostitution on your arrest record um, makes a, a big difference in being able to find housing and employment. Um, and that it was very, very difficult for people who were already impoverished um, to do expungements. Um, it was very difficult for them to find the time or have the ability um, to do such a thing. Um, I do wanna talk further about um, the impacts of being arrested um, and what this does to a person who was already victimized. But the thing that I would like you to, to, to take from this most importantly is that it leaves them with very, very few options to do anything else. So when we talk about um, and, and, and the police did talk to us about this and their representatives, and I think that they have wonderful intentions. Um, you know, their intentions are to take people away from traffickers. This is a very great intention, but unfortunately, I don't believe that we are um, creating that. Um, I, I believe what happens is someone goes to jail and they're away from their trafficker for a very short time before going back to them. Part of the reason I believe they go back to them is once you have a criminal arrest record, it is very, very difficult to get employment in another place. So if doing street-based sex work was my only source of employment and then I get arrested, I'm pretty well stuck in doing something like that or doing something that is illegal or under the table. Um, I also want to add that the current system uh, prevents people who are being trafficked and know it, and many victims don't know it just yet, very similar to the way domestic violence works. Um, it prevents them from actually being able to ever come to a police officer and tell them what is happening. Um, it creates a, a high level of distrust when people are arrested. Um, and, and to the point more, many, many people believe, and this is true by what we can see, that if they were to go to the police and they were to tell them what was happening, that they might be in trouble, they might end up charged with a crime, they might end up in jail or prison. Um, and if you are not familiar with the two cases um, in the U.S. where um, a pair of trafficked minors at, in different situations, uh, both uh, Centoya Brown and Crystal Keyser, um, who were being trafficked, took their trafficking situation into their own hands in large part, I believe, because they didn't have a lot of outlets or ability to do anything else. Um, both of those, uh, both of those young women um, ended up going to 
um, prison for an extended period of time, um, even though they were most certainly trafficking victims. Um, I wanted to bring up something that was also submitted as a part of evidence. Um, this is from the Coalition to Abolish Slavery and Trafficking. They wrote a report and it's entitled Arrest is Not the Answer. This is a, a very extensive um, research piece, very similar to Dittmore, um, which intakes a lot of information. Um, one of the things that um, may or may not be apparent is that when uh, people get arrested for something like this, they often get arrested multiple times. On um, the Coalition for um, Abolishing uh, Slavery and Trafficking Rights, some victims are arrested 30 to 40 times solely for trafficking related offenses. Some are arrested multiple times within a few days. These statistics underscore the key signal that emerges from our study. Trafficking victims are arrested frequently. They are arrested over and over again for crimes they are forced to commit. The benefit that is intended to come from taking them off the street by arresting them is illusory. So one of the things that, that this study finds, and this is a nationwide study, it shows that um, arresting them doesn't actually keep them from reoffending. Um, not only does it not keep them from reoffending, but it actually might help them reoffend. Um, because if I don't have a lot of other options, I don't have another job I can go to, maybe this is the only way I can make money, or maybe I'm in an abusive situation and I'm unable to get out of it. So one of the statistics that I would also like you to look at that's, that's in um, evidence as well was um, this, and I'm, I'm just gonna read this to you, and, and, and this is quite shocking to me, and I, I don't know how you'll feel about it when you hear it. Um, in Nevada, out of 12,812 arrests for solicitation engaging in prostitution and 9,438 convictions, there were only 162 arrests and only 131 convictions for sex trafficking in adult recorded between 2013 and 2019. This is a rate of just over 1% of prostitution arrests resulting in a trafficking conviction. And I really need you to hear that because one of, one of the things that's been presented is we have to arrest these victims so that we can get to their traffickers. And as you can see here, that just plainly cannot be happening in our state. Um, when I look at this, um, this information again is available under evidence. Um, I can just see that we do thousands and thousands of arrests, we do less on average than about one trafficking arrest every month then. So we don't get a lot of trafficking arrests, we get even fewer convictions and the people who are victims in this situation are used as pawns and they are the people who ultimately suffer the worst consequences. Um, similar to Melanie, I, um, Senator Scheibel, I, um, I have some ideas for how uh, police can identify victims of trafficking at the point of arrest, which I think is, you know, a great question. How can that happen? Um, you know, compiling uh, some list of common signs um, for people that are trafficking victims. And, and of course, there are many um, service organizations like the Cupcake Girls, who's joining us today in testimony, that they would be able to um, help create that list, awaken some of the other um, organizations. But, you know, we, we actually have a good idea of what that looks like as well. And there are probably many police officers who, if they thought about it, would also know what that looks like. Um, how can we uh, de deliver services efficiently to victims um, without arresting them? We have a lot of ideas on that, but one of the biggest ones is uh, trying to partner with, with NGOs um, to provide uh, those kinds of services. Um, and um, on, the, on the subject, uh, kind of with Melanie, the, the idea that um, people would uh, pretend to be um, trafficking victims, um, anyone that police are picking up on the street is very likely to be impoverished. Um, people working on the street are not doing something is safe, that, that is safe. And, and like many police have indicated already, almost everyone who they see working on the street has a pimp, which means they're being trafficked. Um, we believe that these people you know, are, are much better served and, and, and all of us would be better served by um, giving these folks resources instead of arresting them um, and, and I will um, turn it back over um, to the next speaker. Thank you so much. With your indulgence, Madam Vice Chair, I would like uh, to allow Ms. Gwynn to rise in testimony. Good afternoon, um, everyone. Oh, am I good? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Caitlin Gwynn, I'm from the Sex Workers Alliance of Nevada. Uh, much of what I want to say has been echoed already in the Senator's comments and Ms. Tucker's comments. Uh, I do just want to stress that human trafficking is a complex, multi-layered issue. And we really need to look at it from all of the angles and come up with some uh, creative conversations and solutions if we 
want to make effective legislation moving forward. I'm really excited by the opportunities that this bill provides. And I do believe that by moving away from a system in which we are arresting people and moving towards a system where we are providing resources without first having to arrest um, survivors, that we will actually make that lasting change and put a dent in human trafficking. Um, the few things that I do want to bring up, I think that we are better served by looking at victims of human trafficking the way that we might look at victims of domestic violence. More than just physically removing someone from their abuser, we need to look at the mental manipulation that can often occur in these sorts of circumstances. So taking someone from their, physically removing someone from their abuser or from their trafficker uh, and putting them through a traumatic experience like arrest is not going to do anything to permanently get them away from that person. Uh, it, in many cases, will often feed into the narrative that the trafficker is giving them that um, I'm here to protect you. I'm the only one that cares for you. Look, the cops don't want to help you. They've just arrested you. They've given you fines. I think that this is a narrative that a lot of victims hear and a lot of victims have come to internalize and believe. And it's one of the things that makes it so difficult for victims to leave their abusers. Arresting folks and putting them through the traumatic experience of having a criminal charge is not doing anything to change them in the long run. Uh, oftentimes, folks are bailed out by their abusers, um, just putting them right back into that system. So I do believe that, uh, you know, also as Ms. Tucker suggested, adding criminal records only encourages or ensures that folks will not be able to leave sex work. Um, how do you think these people are paying for the fines that they're given? It's oftentimes through continuing to do sex work. Uh, having a criminal record makes it very difficult to get a traditional method of employment, also forcing people to continue staying in these trafficking situations. Uh, it is very difficult to get a record sealed or expunged. It takes time, it takes resources. Uh, and also, as Ms. Sarker said, this is really reflected in the numbers as well. We're not seeing the consistent numbers of human trafficking arrests that would uh, be in accordance with the prostitution arrests that we're seeing. It's not working. Uh, we need to look at other solutions. And I'm excited by the way that this bill uh, takes out the harmful aspects of arrest and pushes us towards a more holistic, nuanced understanding of how to actually solve these problems. The last thing that I do want to bring up is this is not extreme. Uh, this proposal uh, has very similar legislation in other states. In fact, we see this in, this is almost a direct copy of statutes in Wyoming. These are quoted in a evidence letter from the National Lawyers Guild. Uh, Nebraska has very similar statutes on this as well. Uh, we see this a lot in Europe, but in terms of other, uh, other states, um, we have affirmative defense charges similar to those seen in the amendment in New Hampshire, Montana, South Carolina. The list goes on. Nevada is really, really behind the curb in creatively dealing with the solution. And if we continue to attack this problem by arresting survivors, we're only going to continue to make the problem of human trafficking worse. I think it's time for us to update our legislation and make a commitment to the to the survivors in Nevada to actually stop this vicious cycle and not punish them even more than they're already being victimized by their traffickers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chair Schreibel, do you have any additional um, individuals or are we moving on to Mr. Armstrong? Mr. Armstrong, please. Mr. Armstrong, when you're ready. Thank you. Uh, Ross Armstrong, Administrator for the Division of Child and Family Services, and I want to thank the um, sponsor for inviting us to just provide some background on how the SB 293 worked. Uh, the first thing I'll say is a lot of times people ask why DCFS is at the table when it comes to victim services, but we're the largest funder of victim services in the state. Last session, um, we brought the VOCA Compensation Program, it's the Victims of Crime Act Compensation and Assistance Programs under one one roof, and so um, we're really trying to grow into the role of, of being the victim services agency for the state. Uh, SB 293 of the last session particularly focused um, on children and moving Nevada's response from a juvenile justice response to a 
human services, social services response. Um, such an abrupt change uh, can be difficult and, and you don't want to have gaps uh, primarily in safety for uh, victims and survivors. So that bill uh, allowed the division uh, to engage in essentially an 18 month process of bringing all the experts to the table um, to engage in the conversations about how do you shift a response from a law enforcement response to a human services response. Uh, it included an appropriation for a contractor that then um, reported to the Division of Child and Family Services uh, in terms of a performance contract to deliver the study that, as it was directed in the statute. Uh, and so it, they, they came up with a great product, presented it to the Interim Committee on Child Welfare and Juvenile Justice, um, and then that became a bill this session that Senator Ratty is carrying. We know that executing the plan as um, all these great minds and stakeholders come together and envision is difficult, especially um, in a state with limited resources for behavioral health services. But it really identified um, what key services were needed uh, and uh, any changes in the statute that would help facilitate um, those changes. And so uh, overall, uh, it's been a positive experience to just take the time necessary and bring the right stakeholders to the table. There's great expertise at the local level um, in the Office of the Attorney General uh, to come together and really take a look at the statutory way we have set up in terms of responding um, to human trafficking. In that case, it was children. This would include um, the entire population. And how do we really start to make a kind of a cohesive movement as a state, not only in the statutory levers that our local agencies have, uh, but in priorities for future enhancements or expansions into services. And so um, I, I thank the sponsor for reaching out and kind of asking questions about how that process worked. Um, we found that it worked better than an abrupt shift from a justice response to a health response. But overall, Nevada's system of victim services um, is still, I think, in development. For so long, it's been an attachment to criminal justice. And really, I think where we're headed is in the positive way of saying victim services should be looked at through a health lens um, and really a holistic um, group of services, understanding that, that housing is health, safety is health, um, and behavioral health is health. So I, I'm happy to answer any questions about how that process went. If Deputy Administrator Mandy Davis, if there are questions about the, the money mechanisms or any of that, um, but that is how that study worked. Uh, and, I, and I believe the sponsor envisions the study would work in a similar way. Thank you, Mr. Armstrong. Um, Chair Scheibel, additional um, presentation or, in, or any other individual? No, I wanna thank Mr. Armstrong for joining us again and um, also my co-presenters and we are ready to answer your questions. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, we will now open it up for questions from members of the committee. Um, and if you can, we're going to do this a little bit old school. So if you've got a question, go ahead and raise your hand in the video, and I will go ahead and call on you. Senator Hansen is always very quick to raise his hand. So in the enthusiasm as well, we'll start with you, Senator Hansen. Uh, actually, Madam Vice Chair here, when we first started, uh, Chair Scheibel gave us these. So I could just do that. Uh, I, I want to say I support the bill 100%. Um, um, I'm especially intrigued, Chair Scheibel and Vice Chair Canizaro, with your expertise uh, in the district attorney's office because, uh, you know, I'm starting to sound like a broken record, but this is my sixth session. And I remember very distinctly my first session, we had a joint uh, judiciary committee hearing. And at that time, Attorney General Masso gave a huge presentation about child sex trafficking. And, and at that time, we had parades of people that were victims, everything else. A couple of questions. First is, of, of the existing laws, and we've had one of these laws or, or one of these bills passed every single session that I've been here. Is there, has there been any significant decline uh, in the amount of um, this type of sex trafficking, because I mean, I've been through all these hearings, and I'm just from the from the description of the lady. I think her name was Elizabeth. It doesn't sound like it's effective at all, and there's an unlimited demand. And in spite of all our efforts, nothing's really changed. Uh, what's your what's your perspective on that? So this is Melanie Scheibel, for the record, state senator from um, District Nine, and I thank you for for the question, Senator Hansen. And I think that. Um, it's 
it's it's a hard question to answer because um, we don't know what we don't know. Um, I think that there is definitely, I think that probably Ms. Turner, sorry, Ms. Tucker could speak better to the numbers, but I, I think we cannot definitively say that the rate of human trafficking is decreasing in Nevada. However, part of that is because we are becoming better at identifying it. So we never want to confuse better identification with the problem actually getting worse because um, sometimes having more prosecutions, knowing about more cases, doesn't mean that there are more cases. It means we're doing a better job of finding them and prosecuting them. And so I think that um, the changes that we have made over the last several sessions have been important. Um, if nothing, I shouldn't say if nothing else, they've been important for numerous reasons. One of those reasons is to uh, find new ways to prosecute actual human traffickers. And um, you, know, you asked me about my experience in the district attorney's office. And again, not speaking for the office, but for myself. I mean, that's why I'm there to go after the actual bad guys who are trafficking people who do not want to be involved in sex work. And it is incredibly important that my office, the office I work for, and any other law enforcement agency in Nevada has the tools to do that. Um, I also think that having had these bills over the last few years has given us the space to have a conversation about what human trafficking looks like and what sex work looks like throughout the state of Nevada. And it's also given us the opportunity to implement particular policies and discover whether or not they're working. And so I think that this is an example of one of those cases where we have a policy of arresting people in order to provide them with services and that is not working. Um, and so this bill tries to change that. Um, and I would, I would I would invite Ms. Tucker to, to weigh in a little bit more heavily on the numbers, which was your original question. Actually, before you go to Ms. Tucker, I just want you to know, I, I agree with the whole concept that we're, we're, we've been picking on the wrong people the whole time. I mean, I've said all along that the victims should not be the ones. I, I've, I've wanted us to much more aggressively go after the Johns, not just the pimps, but the people that actually, uh, you know, hire the girls. And and interestingly enough, the, the, the real problem that we have in Nevada is there is a lack of will on the part of, frankly, the big business communities. They This is part of a package. When you say, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, that has some really powerful implications for some people who have some really perverted appetites. And, uh, and since it's sold as a package deal, I, I've been very discouraged to see that uh, the people that give a lot of lip service to hear in hearings like this actually aren't really that anxious to do that much about it. And here, and besides decriminalizing it from the victim perspective, I would love, and I still, and I've said this all along, we should put online photos of the people that are arrested as Johns. And I'm dead serious. That would do more to discourage this, this unfortunate practice than anything else. Anyway, if you'd like to go to those stats, I'm sorry if I rambled, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Appreciate the opportunity, though. But yeah, I'd love to hear the numbers, see if there's any improvement. And if I could just respond very, very briefly and say that I appreciate that I think you're kind of touching on the income disparity or the disparity between different populations who are more adversely affected by this. People who are impoverished and are engaging in sex work as a means of survival are much more likely to be picked up and arrested than, um, you know, th the things you see in movies do sometimes exist with high paid call girls who work for an agency and have the anonymity of, you know, working through, through the internet and they're much less likely to get arrested. Um, but I, I also want to point out that there are also issues with criminalizing the, the purchasing of sex because that still drives the industry underground. And, um, you know, for somebody who is trafficking other people, whether it is the people that they are trafficking or the clients they are serving who are getting arrested, getting arrested is bad for business. And so, um, you know, I could envision situations in which even if we you know, are not going after, if, if law enforcement is not going after the people who are performing sex acts for money, but they're going after the people who are paying for it, um, and that person who is providing the service could still be, could still face retaliation from the person who's trafficking them. And I think that's, is one of the complexities of the issue. And it's just another, it's one of the reasons that I proposed the amendment that gives us a year to talk about it, think about it, look at other jurisdictions and come up with the best way to thread that needle. 
Um, I just wanted to speak to your point um, about what are the statistics. Can you please um, identify yourself for the record? I'm so sorry. My name is Stephanie Tucker. Um, I, I wanted to let you know, um, I do not have this in front of me, but there is something um, called safeharbor.org. Safe Harbor bills are, uh, this is a safe harbor bill. Um, they are typically levied at minors. And so the bills that you're referring to in the past legislative sessions, those were um, all safe harbor uh, for minor trafficking victims. And I wanted to just point out this one thing that, that maybe um, kind of sheds a little bit of light on this. Um, Nevada, just a few years ago, had, I believe, an F rating in um, safe harbor. So so uh, the, the rating was based on um, how well Nevada protected minor trafficking victims, and um, it, it, we got a failing grade. Um, and uh, at this point, uh, I believe when this was updated in 2020, um, we were given an A rating. Um, so while that is not an exact answer to your question, maybe it's kind of a um, overarching statement about uh, how much better or what a difference that seems to make according to anti-trafficking organizations. Well, Stephanie, thank you. Actually, that was. That's actually encouraging. So I've kind of wondered, we pass law after law around here, what is the actual impact on the people that are the victims of this uh, of this horrible traffic? Well, anyway, th thank you, uh, uh, Chair Scheibel, for answering those questions. And thank you, uh, uh, Madam Vice Chair, for allowing me this question. Thank you, Senator. Um, we'll move on to questions from other members of the committee. If you have a question, please go ahead and raise your hand so that I can see you. Okay. I am not seeing any additional questions from members of the committee. Uh, Vice, Vice Chair Canizaro, if I may. Okay, please, Senator Harris, go ahead. Thank, thank you so much. Um, I'll yield to, to Senator Pickard. I think he might have a question, but then I have one following up if that's okay with you. That is that is fine. If members of the committee have questions, please raise your hand so that I can see them in the video, um, which, is, which would be helpful to me. So we'll go Senator Pickard, then Senator Harris. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Senator Harris. You certainly could have gone. Um, uh, I too am uh, supportive of the idea that we want to uh, focus our attention on the right people. Uh, although I, I, I'm not a little, I'm, I'm a little confused. It, it sounded like uh, 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 Senator Scheibel, your your uh, answer suggested that maybe we were decriminalizing uh, prostitution entirely uh, or considering it. But uh, the first question I have has to do with the uh, uh, the amendment and what is and isn't changing. Um, it's not particularly clear, but it sounds like this is moving essentially to a study um, uh, that uh, uh, we're trying to come up with the best approach to this, or will this actually go into effect, um, although in 2023? Melanie Scheibel for the record. And uh, the conceptual amendment is very conceptual at this point in time. And I want everyone listening to know that I'm very open to suggestions and feedback on it. And uh, the idea is to take the provisions that were already contained in the bill as written, improve them, and then project them out to the year 2023. And so that is to give us the time, not just to do a study, but to create a plan and implement that plan. So that by the time in 2023 that police departments are no longer able to arrest women who they think are being trafficked in order to provide them with services. We've already built up the infrastructure so that there is somebody else who responds to the scene. There is a nonprofit organization that can provide safe housing. We have come up with a solution to the question of how to provide them with medical care. All of the questions that arise with, what are you going to do if you're not going to arrest them? So it gives us a timeline to do that. Um, and it also, um, again, I have to I have to really thank uh, Mr. Armstrong from the Department of Child and Family Services within DHHS because it puts the burden kind of really on them. Um, you know, it designates a person, a uh, an agency that is responsible for this. And um, I I'm very very grateful that he has been willing to work with me on that and to take on that responsibility because without that. Um, we would be in a very different position if we didn't have a state agency that was ready and willing to work through all of those questions, just like they did for children uh, for the rest of the population. All right, thank you. Uh, so it sounds like uh, the conceptual amendment will eventually take this to 
uh, becoming a plan for a 2023 session that will then implement or, or take the ideas and uh, uh, create the, the statutes. Uh, so that actually will, will uh, uh, obviate the need for some of my questions. Let me just ask uh, a question with respect to um, uh, what's written in the amendment in terms of the affirmative defense. Um, uh, where we provide an affirmative defense, and obviously that doesn't mean they're completely off the hook. It might just be a mitigation uh, of the penalties. Uh, but we've some we, we've maintained an affirmative defense then to murder and kidnapping, uh, aiding and abetting, sexual assault, robbery, some others. Um, uh, is the idea that uh, these victims may be so controlled that they would have participated in these things? Um, uh, only because they were being coerced by their uh, 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 by their pimps, by their traffickers, uh, or is there something broader uh, to that uh, affirmative defense? Melanie Scheibel, for the record, and that is correct. And part of the reason that I, um, in the conceptual amendment, just said that we'll provide for the availability of an affirmative defense is that, as a lawyer, I appreciate the intricacies of. Um, what a person would have to prove and whether it is that they have to prove, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt that they committed this because they were a victim of human trafficking or in the course of their human trafficking or under duress of being a victim of human trafficking. There are lots of ways that we could structure that, but you hit the, the nail on the head with the idea is that if I only committed this crime because I am being trafficked and it was my only escape or my pimp forced me to do it, threatened me to do it, then a jury should be able to hear that. And in some cases that might be, um, it might rise to the level of an acquittal, just like self-defense does for murder, if it rises to that level. All right, I don't thank know you. If, I think yeah. Ms. Gwynn might wanna uh, sure. weigh in. I'd just like to also add that um, these, these amendments were made with the idea that the person might be committing these crimes against their trafficker. When we look at the cases of Cintoya Brown and oh. Crystal Keezer, these are women who fought against their traffickers um, and in, in one case ended up murdering their trafficker and were still given lengthy sentences for the murder of their trafficker. So, you know, also to give those opportunities for crimes that are committed under the duress of their trafficker, we're also including crimes committed against the trafficker. Sure. And, and uh, I, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't mind if we were a little more specific about uh, relieving them of a criminal liability were they to uh, um, uh, do harm to their traffickers, uh, but we won't go down that road. Uh, the last question I have then, uh, Madam Chair, is just uh, when we're looking, and I'm looking specifically, and I know that this may be changed, but section one, sub three, uh, and then it's repeated throughout uh, the bill, is we're allowing law enforcement or prosecutors, in addition to the court, to make a really a substantive determination as to the culpability of the individual or whether or not they're uh, a victim. Um, how does that work in practice? I, you know, I, I'm a lawyer, but I don't practice pra or, uh, uh, criminal law. Uh, are there, is this a, typical thing that law enforcement gets to make the initial call uh, if they think they're a trafficker and, and then that's a, a conclusive determination. How does that work? Melanie Scheibel for the record. And um, again, this is something that I look forward to fleshing out in more detail through the plan um, because there are probably better ways to identify victims of human trafficking, better ways than others and better ways than what we are using. Um, I can speak to my my personal, it, it, personal professional experience. Um, you know, one example might be if um, there was somebody in front of me who, whose case I was supposed to prosecute and I discovered that there was a previous conviction against somebody else for trafficking them then that would tell me that that person was a victim of human trafficking. I'd be able to look at the timelines and say, oh, I have a person who falls under the, you know, the auspice of this law and I should dismiss the charges against them. A judge could do the same thing. A police officer could do the same thing. Um, but I think that it does allow for some flexibility because you don't graduate victim school with a with a certificate that you can show to law enforcement officers. So, um, you know, sometimes it will be 
uh, also sometimes there'll be disagreements, right? Uh, a police officer will say, no, this person was definitely part of the trafficking ring and the prosecutor and the defense attorney or a judge will say, no, I really think they're a victim here. And um, I don't know that this bill completely solves that problem, but I think that um, we can, you know, at least start with the very obvious cases and make sure we're not arresting and prosecuting those people. And we can better refine those cases in the gray area or better right. refine how we address cases in the gray area. Sure. All right. Thank you. And I, I, I too, am supportive of this bill, uh, the idea, and uh, even better, the idea of putting together a, a, a structural mechanism to come up with a plan that actually addresses it. Because uh, like Senator Hansen, I, I've seen this in every session and uh, uh, it's gotten a little discouraging because it doesn't look like our prior efforts have really uh, made a dent, even though that's always how it's presented is we're going to make a dent and I don't see any dents. Anyway, uh, thank you for bringing the bill and thank you, Madam Vice Chair, for allowing me to ask the questions. Thank you, Senator. We'll move to Senator Harris. Thank you, Vice Chair uh, Canizaro. Uh, my question is kind of two-sided. So uh, I know Nevada is kind of lagging in, in other states in this area. In those states who have kind of been at the forefront uh, do we see uh, some, uh, I guess, decrease in the prosecution of, uh, of sex traffickers, right? Has it become substantially more difficult? Uh, and then on the converse side, I'd like to know in those same states, uh, have we seen increased participation in services for, for those being trafficked? I don't know if you want me to take this one, Ms. Tucker, or you want me to go ahead. So um, I believe that like submitted in, in evidence here, I'm sorry, Stephanie Tucker, um, for the record. Um, I believe that you can see, um, we have a couple of um, pieces of evidence that are submitted um, where it's mostly been done in like um, jurisdictions, like city jurisdictions. Um, so for instance, like San Francisco uh, just declines to prosecute these cases now. Um, and that was submitted as evidence. Um, the question of, does it increase the amount of services provided? Um, I, that is not actually something that I've seen a lot of states like take initiative on or at least publish initiatives about. Um, I do think that this would make um, Nevada kind of a leader um, in that way, especially when it comes to like treating them as victims of crime. Um, in some places, like for instance, if you look um, at San Francisco, uh, one of the initiatives that they're doing um, is to just basically direct people to uh, counseling, social work, advocacy, and other services. Um, but that is probably the clearest example where that's spelled out as a part of the policy for the uh, Metropolitan Police Department there. And if anyone wants to address the, the prosecution side. Um, this is Melanie Scheibel for the record. Uh, and I think that We've not seen that it's become more difficult to, to prosecute human trafficking cases. Um, I think we've seen in Nebraska, where they have um, a fairly progressive immunity law, that the human trafficking prosecutions have increased, which I think is attributable to being able to identify them better. Um, but I also want to point out that, in, I'm pulling up the report right now, which I'm going to send you. In Nebraska, they had a total of 192 human trafficking investigations, which is just so much smaller than what we see in Nevada. So um, I think that that just underscored for me the importance of taking um, an individualized approach to this. I would also just add um, that this is Stephanie Tucker again. Um, in the uh, Dittmore study from 2009 on um, raids and arrest um, for people, um, one of the things, and this is a qualitative research study, so um, just bear in mind that this is them giving interviews to people. Um, this is them giving interviews to people who were victims of sex trafficking, um, identified by law enforcement. Um, many of the people indicated there 
um, they, they indicated in this study that essentially people were far less likely to cooperate and collaborate with police officers when they had been arrested. Um, especially and specifically when they had been arrested as a result of a raid. Um, so human trafficking, busts or sting operations as they're uh, called, um, made them far, far less likely to cooperate with police. Um, many people in this study um, initially declined to cooperate with police um, and then were, um, for lack of a better word here, uh, coerced um, or, or told that um, they might be able to get a deal or, or something like this, um, and, and then they, they did. Um, one of the things and one of the um, problems I would tell you that uh, the Attorney General's office brought up um, in a different meeting was that it is extraordinarily hard to get people that they have arrested to later testify against someone that has trafficked them, even though the Attorney General's office is fairly certain that they have a good case. Um, now, this is me speaking, again, um, personal expertise, but when I have people uh, in my office, um, they do not trust police officers after they've been arrested. Um, they also tend to have a highly negative bias towards police officers after arrest. Um, this is also something that bears out in, in the Dittmore study as well, um, if you have a, a chance to take a look at that. It is almost 100 pages, um, so you might have to you might have to skim a little bit, but um, there's some good information uh, qualitatively about people's personal experiences with that in there as well. Thank you. Any other questions, Senator Harris? No, thank you. Great. Um, questions from other members of the committee? I had just a few um, for clarification purposes, and I appreciate, um, first of all, I think the conceptual amendment goes a long way to being able to piece this together in a way that makes sense. Um, I guess one of the things, and I have a vague recollection of a very similar conversation from last legislative session, um, where we are asking for law enforcement to be a determiner of whether or not someone is in fact a victim of being trafficked and what sort of issues that may present if for example they they don't make the right determination or they later make a different determination um, or you know let's say there's there's some indication that someone may be reporting this but then it it later becomes apparent that perhaps they were doing that in order to avoid arrest how do you deal with that and, and placing some of that burden on, on either a court or some or a law enforcement officer or a prosecuting attorney as identified in the bill? Melanie Scheibel, for the record, and I think there are um, two answers to your question. The first one is that the plan involved, the, the plan as outlined in the conceptual amendment includes developing a tool for determining who and who is who is not a human trafficking victim. And um, that proposal uh, was brought to me. I hope she doesn't mind me calling her out by Melissa Holland at Awaken, who has been incredibly helpful to me through this process and you know, suggested that we, we move the responsibility for establishing who is and who is not a victim um, to the experts in the field, uh, people who work with human trafficking victims all day, every day, who are service providers on the ground. Um, of course, we also need our law enforcement partners to be educated in that tool, to know how to use that tool, and to also be able to make those determinations. Um, I think that it's important to note that this bill does not provide any kind of sanction for making the quote wrong determination because um, this is supposed to be a collaborative process. We want people to make the right call and do the right thing because we all share the goal of ending human trafficking. Um, I would suggest that it is possible um, with other legislation coming through the uh, legislature this year that if the if there were a particular agency that was um, having a particularly high rate of wrong assessments, the attorney general's office would be able to investigate that as a pattern and practice abuse or as a pattern and practice issue. And um, I, I think that the, the other thing that the bill does is it provides numerous off ramps for people who are identified as victims so that even if you're not identified at the beginning, but you're identified somewhere in the middle, you can still enjoy the protections of, of having, enjoy the protections of the law 
Um, and I think that, um, I hope that answers your question. It does, it does to a certain extent. I guess that brings up an, another interesting question as you mentioned sort of off ramps because part of this bill says that you shall not, may not, sorry, shall not it arrest or issue a citation to a person. Um, and I don't know if that language, that language doesn't seem to be changed in the conceptual amendment. Um, and so that's where, I guess, if you're looking at a tool that might be utilized by individuals who are providing services, that, that seems to make some sense, but that's a hard determination to be making when an arrest occurs or when a citation is issued. Uh, Senator, uh, this is Melanie Scheibel for the record. And um, I think that, first of all, I'm always open to um, you know changes to this. That part of the bill would not go into effect until 2023. And so the, I, the idea there is that by 2023, we have a mechanism in place so that officers can say, all right, I ask these three questions. If all the answers are yes, then I arrest them. If all the answers are no, they're diverted. Or, you know, whatever the tool says, they utilize the tool, and then we can look at that to, to determine whether or not they're, they're going in the right direction. Um, and, and, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, I wasn't trying to cut you off. I thought you were done talking. I was. Um, yeah, and that makes, I mean, and that makes sense to me. I guess I just, I, and I'm glad that you're open to talking about some changes to the bill because I think there needs to be a little bit more finesse there between, you know, if at some point we're providing other off ramps for a decision that may have been made at the time of an arrest or a citation, or we're saying you shall not arrest or cite, that inf if that information can change, even if you, and I understand the, the effective date, but even if you have a tool, there's still the potential because somebody is making a determination at that point of liability or not liability and arrest or not arrest um, that I think there just needs to be a little bit more finesse there to ensure that this can both work in that in that capacity, but also that we're not asking for some of these determinations to be made in a way that um, it is that ends up being detrimental to, frankly, the victim of human trafficking, or that ends up placing everyone in a, in a tough spot if that decision changes. Um, the other questions I had relate to some of the, and I know you mentioned earlier, and, and so I appreciate and would love to have the opportunity to speak more about this, of the affirmative defense piece um, under number three in the conceptual amendment. And then also what appears to be, and I, I just wanted some clarification on this on, on section four, mitigation evidence. Um, so I know there was mention of instances where individuals were charged and convicted of murder, yet still were given long prison sentences, even though the reasons for that would have been, um, would have been related to being the victim of human trafficking. And I guess I wanted to clarify that you are talking about two different things. In section three, you're talking about the affirmative defense, which would obviate um, criminal liability as do all affirmative defenses if those conditions are met versus in section four, as I read it, it seems to be, it seems to be mitigation evidence that could impact the sentence once someone is convicted, which is different than an affirmative defense. Yes, that is correct. They are different, and that's why they're broken out into those two different sections. And sorry, Melanie Scheibel, for the record. And just like you said, um, establishing the parameters of the affirmative defense, I think, is incredibly important. Um, and it it requires more than one line in one amendment. And it's work that I'm willing to do. Um, yes, and I think that's I think that's um, a good thing because uh, you know NRS. NRS 194.010 and other case law provides for affirmative, the affirmative defense of duress under certain circumstances. And so I know this is not fully fleshed out, so I'm happy to continue that conversation. But um, I do have um, questions and, and concerns over how that would be worded and how that may change that or if we're creating an, a completely different um, affirmative defense of duress under certain circumstances, what would be required to be proven what those factors would be if it's going to be different from what we already have in law as an affirmative defense of duress. Um, and then also, I think, on the on the mitigation evidence, what exactly would need to be presented, 
when and what impact that could or or would have on a sentence, whether we're leaving it um, to the judge's discretion. Because again, I think even if you had evidence of duress after conviction, that's something that would be permitted um, under current law to be presented at sentencing in mitigation. Um, Melanie Scheibel, for the record, and yes, and with the mitigation portion, um, I, I agree that it would be allowed under current law as a general mitigating factor. Um, the reason that I put it in there was thinking about the places where we specifically provide for mitigating circumstances, like when you're talking about an additional penalty, an enhancement penalty. Um, and I'm frankly, I'm not sure that it needs to be outlined in the statute that um, you know, being a victim of human trafficking is a mitigating factor pursuant to, you know, I'm looking at 193.161 right now, which is, you know, additional penalties for felonies committed on properties of schools. Um, and there is certainly more work to be done on the bill. Um, I wanted to su just suggest in concept that this could still be used for um, at the time of sentence. Really, that could still be used at the time of sentencing, even if the affirmative defense was um, brought in a trial or earlier in the proceedings and was unsuccessful, just like any other defense. I hope it might be okay to say this. Um, I don't know um, what exactly the line of thinking um, is on this, but um, I do know that, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, your name sorry. Is Stephanie Tucker, I apologize. Um, I, I do know that um, in a couple of the cases that have been brought up uh, this afternoon, um, both the case of Centoya Brown and Crystal, Crystal Keezer, um, that these were not allowed to be used as affirmative defenses. Um, so that is kind of, uh, I, again, I am absolutely not an expert in law, and I know both of you are, um, but I, I just wanted to add that point that there have been cases in the U.S., and again, I'm not talking about Nevada um, specifically, so I, I couldn't say, but where um, either it wasn't allowed to be brought up or um, it wasn't allowed to be taken into account um, for whatever reason. No, and thank you, Ms. Tucker. I do appreciate that, and I think um, those are valid questions and, and concerns, and I just wanted to make sure that as we're talking about this conceptual amendment, as we're talking about other additional changes um, that I did have and would love to continue the conversation with Chair Scheibel over what, how this interplay works with current affirmative defenses of duress, as already outlined in statute and in case law in Nevada, and then also the mitigation, the mitigation evidence, which also is provided for in Nevada law. And I think that may be the, the big difference is that it's it's Nevada law versus other state law or other states that have Supreme Court decisions or other case law that, that says, you know, in certain circumstances, you can't use particular types of those evidence. So um, obviously this is, I appreciate the conceptual amendment and um, just look forward to working with the chair on. Additional questions from any members of the committee? All right, I'm not seeing any, let me check. I'm like learning to work Zoom for the first time. All right, I don't see anything on Zoom. I don't see anybody waving their hands at me. So we are going to go ahead and thank you, Chair Scheibel, for the presentation, um, Ms. Tucker, Ms. Gwynn, and, and Mr. Armstrong as well. We are going to move to testimony on the bill, and we will begin with testimony in uh, support of Senate Bill 164. If you are here in support of Senate Bill 164 and wish to speak, please pay attention. We're going to turn it over to our broadcast production services team who will be able to navigate those who are here in support. And that's where we will start. And I'll turn it over to you uh, to broadcast. Thank you, Vice Chair Canizaro. To testify in support on Senate Bill 164, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, to testify in support on SB 164, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 377. Please press star six to unmute. Once again, caller with the last three digits, 377. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Then slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes to speak and may begin. 
Good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. My name is Deshaun Jackson, B-A-S-H-U-N-J-A-C-K-S-O-N. I serve as the Director of Children's Safety and Welfare Policy with the Children's Advocacy Alliance. And we stand in support of Senate Bill 164. We believe this bill is essential to the protect protection of victims who have been sex trafficked. We believe that this bill is essential to allowing victims to remain victims. We understand that those who experience human trafficking have no choice and oftentimes uh, end up in these situations. So we believe this bill is important in ensuring that they're not criminalized and that they receive the help that they need. So again, thank you all so much for considering this bill. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, caller. As a brief reminder, if you recently joined our call this afternoon, we are currently on support testimony for Senate Bill 164. If you'd like to provide support testimony at this time, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 461, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes to speak and may begin. Good afternoon, Carrie Kramer, K-E-R-R-I-E-K-R-A-M-E-R, -E 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 with our Denton Partners here on behalf of the Cupcake Girls. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee. As an organization that believes in and provides respect and resources for sex workers and survivors of human trafficking, we believe SB 164 and its proposed amendment are a very good step in the right direction in helping survivors become whole again. We truly appreciate the sponsor for bringing this legislation forward and including us in the stakeholder meetings. And we look forward to continuing to work with law enforcement and other stakeholders to create a sustainable plan that provides much needed support and resources for survivors of trafficking going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits, 897, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes to speak and maybe. Good afternoon, Chair Scheibel, Madam Vice Chair Kenazaro, and members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. For the record, my name is Melissa Holland, um, M-E-L-I-S-S-A-H-O-L-L-A-N-D. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Awaken, a Northern Nevada-based nonprofit that works with victims of survivors of the sex trade. I'm here in full support of the amended version of SB 164. Um, there's already been incredibly invaluable information that's voiced regarding the complexity of sex trafficking, service provision, care for survivors, the trauma bond, and, and so much more. Um, there's really just one story I kind of want to share that adds and sheds light on what I believe to be the crux and the heart of this bill. A few years ago, uh, I went to a court hearing to support a woman I know who's a victim of trafficking. Um, just for the sake of this, this story, we'll call her Amanda. When I, when I say I go to the court hearing to, to support the victim of trafficking, I would assume you're already imagining a scene that would involve Amanda um, in a position that where justice is going to be served for the crimes committed against her. Unfortunately, this court scene involved Amanda in handcuffs, awaiting to go before the judge to hear her charges. The image of Amanda in handcuffs actually had a really profound impact on me because in the human trafficking movement, um, the image that we often see, and they're, they're very sensationalized images, but the image you almost often see in regard to human trafficking awareness campaigns is that image. It's two hands in handcuffs. That's the picture we use to show the public what human trafficking looks like. Sadly, that's the image, that's the reality of how our justice system is treating victims of human trafficking. So when those that are called to serve and protect are actually mirroring the images we use to describe traffickers, we absolutely must reevaluate what we're believing justice to truly be. This bill does that. This bill gives us the opportunity to reevaluate the image of how we do serve and protect, and that we should not model it after the images we use to describe and bring light to human trafficking. In, in regard to, to some of the questions that have been asked um, about whether or not this method is effective, uh, I need to first disclose I'm, I'm speaking as a representative from a human trafficking, anti-trafficking organization, not as a representative of law enforcement, but we do work with law enforcement. And a couple of years ago, Washoe County, since that image, they've, they've made a lot of changes up here 
And since that image, they, they developed a task force and they've started changing the way they interact with victims. And they've begun to move in the direction of not arresting victims. And I can tell you as a result, anecdotally, I'll tell you this, and there's some data, but we are seeing increased participation and success in the, in the arrest of traffickers and, and their prosecutions. In 2019, there was 11 trafficking-related arrests. In 2020, there was 28. And 30 solicitation of a minor charges. And 31 individuals, instead of getting arrested, got advocacy services from a law enforcement advocate. So I am in full support of the amendments and, and the SB 164, and I'm so thankful to Senator Scheibel for being thoughtful and how this will be implemented and to see what true justice looks like, because it's not the image of handcuffs not for our victims. So thank you very much. Thank you, caller. And as a brief reminder, we're currently on support testimony for Senate Bill 164. If you'd like to provide support testimony at this time, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 683, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes to speak and may begin. Hello, my name is Jazz Sheffer. That's J-A-Z-Z-S-H-E-F-F-E-R. I'm a member of SWAN, the Sex Worker Alliance of Nevada, and today I'll be reading testimony from a SWAN member that wishes to remain anonymous. Okay. Both my parents have been in and out of prison since I was little, and I grew up mostly in foster care. After 18, I didn't really feel like I had anyone because I had aged out of foster care. I always felt like a lucky person then, though, because I had a boyfriend who I thought loved me. It was his idea in the first, in the first place that this was a way I could make money for us. He knew people that did this. I felt like he was the only person in the world who really loved me or understood me. But it's true he did take all my money and make me work as a prostitute to support us. And later, I see that he was abusive too, and I know that he coerced me to do this even though I didn't really want to. After I've been to therapy for this for a long time and being away from the situation, I know mentally that this is not really so much my fault, but it feels like people would judge me or blame me about what happened. Like, they would think I'm bad for it, even though I know now this was sex trafficking. I didn't think that someone in my situation, should, I don't think that someone in my situation should have to go to jail or have a criminal record. I was pretty young and I did not know everything I know now. And I didn't see that this was so abusive yet or that I was being used and manipulated. I know I'm lucky I didn't go to jail like so many people do, but it's hard for me to think that people think I am like a criminal for this because I know this was the hardest time I've ever had in my life. It's even hard to talk about now, and I never want anyone to know this happened to me. I think a lot of people in this situation have a lot of shame, too, because it's like talking about rape and people think it's your fault. I spent a lot of time thinking this was my fault. I want this bill to pass because maybe I could have felt like I could do something better than what I did if I thought I could go to police or if I knew I wouldn't be a criminal. Maybe I would have gotten to get help sooner. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits, 929. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Then slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes to speak and may begin. Hi, my name is Amy Marie Merrill, A-M-Y-M-E-R-R-E-L-L. -E I'm the executive director of the Cupcake Girls, a local nonprofit that works in the prevention and aftercare of sex trafficking within the state of Nevada. On behalf of the 759 clients the Cupcake Girls served in 2020, 60% of which disclosed that they were being sex trafficked, we want to testify that this bill will make positive strides towards the eradication of sex trafficking, which is one of the goals we fight for every day as an organization. The Cupcake Girls spends an enormous amount of time working to reunite our clients with their children because of arrest, and then their children being placed into foster care to which it has been proven for decades now that children are far better off to stay with their parents over foster care, except for extreme circumstances. 
The Cupcake Girls also spends an enormous amount of time working on record expungements so that our clients are able to stay out of and away from the prison industrial complex. The Cupcake Girls have many clients that are desperately trying to pay their fines in crude by arrest when we have seen data now for years that arrest does not help in sex trafficking. It actually magnifies the problem. Arresting survivors causes the people who are being trafficked to go deeper and deeper underground, causing even more harm to the individuals being trafficked, as well as better business for pimps who are trafficking the individuals. Handing someone a packet of resources, arresting them, booking them, and then having them deal with up to four months of missing work, paying for daycare, incurring mounting debt on someone who has just been trafficked, just to get their record expunged is not protecting nor serving our community. And I know from conversations with local PD that the officers are wanting to protect and serve this community well. As Senator Picard said, what has been done has not made a dent, so it's time to try something new. We believe that everyone in our community wants to end sex trafficking, and we are asking that this be a step forward with survivors who have been harmed and those who are currently being harmed by the systems in place. The survivors who have written testimony and who are speaking today. Let's listen to survivors. Let's believe survivors. Thank you, Colin. Hello. Caller with the last three digits 080, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes to speak and may begin. Hi, Jim Hoffman, Nevada Attorneys for Criminal Justice. NACJ supports AB 164. I want to make sure everyone is clear. This is not a decriminalization bill. An increasing number of people support decriminalization in recognition of the fact that many people who engage in sex work are doing so voluntarily. Other people disagree with this perspective. This broader conversation is ongoing, and NACJ believes it is an important one to have separately from this bill. However, there is one area where a consensus is emerging. People who are not voluntarily engaging in sex work should be assisted in moving out of the bad situation they're in. The criminalization of trafficking victims is an obstacle to helping people escape trafficking. SB 164 helps to remove this obstacle, and so NACJ supports it. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits, 137. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes to speak and may begin. Hi, my name is Melissa Brudo, M-E-L-I-S-S-A, last name B-R-O-U-D-O. Thank you so much for uh, hearing on this incredibly important issue today. I am in strong support of SB 164. I'm a longtime attorney and advocate for sex workers and survivors of human trafficking. I've dedicated most of my legal career to doing defense, criminal defense, for survivors of human trafficking. So really exactly what this bill um, is seeking to do in Nevada, which is to ameliorate the harms of the criminal justice system for people that are being forced to engage in prostitution uh, and, and trafficking generally. We've seen, and what, what I, I personally seen in my practice is, so many people in the sex industry who wish to come forward to report violence or abuse that has occurred against them or colleagues or, or others that they have seen and they fear coming forward, right, for fear of, of, of arrest, of course, um, or abuse or assault at the hands of police officers. And so while this certainly wouldn't, you know, remedy all of the relationship, the very fractured relationship between people in the sex industry and law enforcement, it would go a very long way in sending the message that everybody's life matters, everybody's bodily autonomy and, and safety and health matters, and that people need to be able to come forward to report crimes committed against them. And in fact, I this legislative session, I'm testifying in Rhode Island, New York, and Vermont as well on immunity legislation. 
And in terms of affirmative defense, this is immensely important. Um, as I said at the beginning, I've represented, it spent with my career representing survivors of human trafficking in vacating or erasing their criminal records in, in New York. And, you know, we really need to get in front of that problem rather than <laughs> have, um, you know, legislation after the fact, right? We need to not prosecute people who are survivors of trafficking, and this would, would do that. So uh, I want to thank you all and, and voice my support. Thank you. Thank you, caller. And for those of you who recently joined us this afternoon, we are currently on support testimony for Senate Bill 164. If you'd like to provide support testimony at this time, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 540, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes to speak and may begin. Good afternoon, Vice Chair Cannizzaro and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Serena Evans, S-E-R-E-N-A-E-V-A-N-S, and I'm the Policy Specialist for the Nevada Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence. I want to first start by thanking Senator Scheibel for her work on this bill and for bringing together so many stakeholders throughout the state on this matter and allowing us to be part of those important conversations. NCE DSB is here today in support of Senate Bill 164. So much of what we want to say has already been touched on through the wonderful presentation today and through the testimony before me, but there's just a couple key points that I really want to drive home. Every time a victim survivor is arrested and detained, they are at risk for having their children taken away from them, losing their job, and missing out on critical income in which they rely to house and care for themselves and their potential children. Being arrested also puts victim survivors at risk for not being able to obtain future housing or stable employment, which increases their risk factors for additional victimization. Aside from the effects that arresting a victim survivor has on their personal life, we know that arresting victim survivors is not an easy way out of trafficking. Many victim survivors do not identify as a victim, and being arrested only drives them back into the arms of their perpetrator because it's the only life they know, or they are the only person they can rely on to bail them out of jail. In order to truly help victim survivors of trafficking, we must increase community advocacy and community support and meet these individuals with the empathy and unique resources that they require. Being detained in a jail cell does not connect a victim survivor to resources and does not offer them the compassion and coordinated community response that they deserve. We are in favor of this bill as it lays the legislative groundwork to be able to treat victim survivors of trafficking with dignity instead of penalizing them and limiting their future because of their victimization. Thank you so much. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits, 611. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes to speak and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. This is John Pirro, J-O-H-N-P-I-R-O from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. And we'd like to testify in support of this bill and thank Senator Scheibel for bringing this bill forward. Well, Ms. Holland is correct when she testified that trafficking victims in handcuffs are what we normally see from our side of the criminal justice system. Uh, and I didn't get to present to you this session, but those of you that were on the committee last session heard my story about who I call Mrs. Smith because I don't like to use her real name. When the police miss a legitimate trafficking victim and when the prosecutors miss it, it is us as public defenders that generally catch it. And then it's a struggle to get to the attention of both prosecutors and police. I'm still working to clean up Mrs. Smith's record from being trafficked. Uh, and it's a long and arduous process that she should have never had to deal with. So I'm thankful that we're bringing a bill forward to stop criminalizing survivors. Uh, because I think you are right, Senator Hansen, that some of the measures that are put in place aren't having the intended effects that we'd hoped they have. So it's good that we're moving in this direction. So we support this bill and the efforts. We just ask that you include us in some of the conversations because we are crucial catchers of people that the police and the prosecution miss. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits, 318. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You'll have two minutes to speak and may begin. 
Good afternoon, Vice Chair Canazaro and members of the Senate Judiciary. This is Kendra Berchi, K-E-N-D-R-A. B-E-R-T-S-C-H-Y with the Washoe County Public Defender's Office. On March 27, 2014, the United Nations Human Rights Committee urged the United States to end the prosecution of human trafficking victims for crimes that they are forced to commit. Again, that was in 2014. And here we are finally today on March 30th, 2021, discussing legislation that would end the prosecution of human trafficking victims. Our office fully supports the bill as well as the amended version. What we are doing is not working. Retraumatizing a victim does not build trust. It does not solve the issues. Arresting victims simply does not work. Unfortunately, victims are still being caught in the crosshairs where we are attempting to ensure that we are catching those who are trafficking victims versus trying to ensure that victims are receiving services. I would just note that unfortunately, I can think of several cases where not the one that Ms. Holland um, referenced where I have represented victims of human trafficking and it is quite an ordeal to try to convince the district attorney and law enforcement and other members of the judiciary that that person was a victim and should receive services rather than go to prison. So we strongly support this bill and agree with Mr. Pirro. We would like to continue to be involved in this conversation to ensure that we are all working on supporting survivors. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits, 058, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes to speak and may begin. I'm Casey Stewart, C-A-S-E-Y-S-T-E-W-A-R-D. I'm an advocate for sex workers and sex trafficking victims and a representative of Suave Vegas, a local mutual aid fund for people in the sex trade. Today I'll be reading a statement on behalf of someone who was unable to attend but wanted their story shared. My name is Aaliyah Sheep. I'm 23 years old and a lifelong Nevadan. I was a victim of child trafficking. As a teenager, one of my peers approached me about a money-making opportunity. She told me that she worked at a massage parlor where she made hundreds of dollars an hour. I was immediately interested. I met the owner of the massage parlor, a much older man. He told me that I could keep all the money I made while working for him. All I had to do was give him affection and sexual favors. I didn't think of myself as a victim. To me, the massage parlor job was a fair business exchange. But years later, I saw the old man who ran the massage parlor on the news arrested for human trafficking. In retrospect, I realized that he abused and trafficked me as well. I tell you this story because trafficking is not often a black and white scenario where a stranger kidnaps you from a grocery store. Trafficking happens even when kids live in supportive, loving homes. Impoverished children are even more likely to become victims. Many victims are coerced and to some extent participate willingly. Had I been arrested while working at the massage parlor, I would not have identified myself as a victim and I would have had a criminal record for something that I did while coerced by a trafficker. I urge you to pass SB 164. It allows trafficking victims to access resources without facing criminal penalties. In our jurisdiction, there are children serving sentences for prostitution. Harsher penalties do not serve as deterrence and they do not make our communities safer. As lawmakers, it is your duty to make our communities safer. For that reason, I encourage you to focus less on criminal penalties and more on providing mental health services and alleviating food and housing insecurity and circumstances surrounding poverty. Trafficking happens because victims feel stuck in their circumstances. Punishing them for being vulnerable is not a solution. There is no penalty for an abuser that is worth implicating and endangering a victim. For this reason, you should vote in favor of SB 164. Thank you. Thank you, caller. And as a brief reminder, we are currently on support testimony for Senate Bill 164. If you'd like to provide support testimony at this time, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 695. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes to speak and may begin. 
Good afternoon, Vice Chair Canizaro. This is Holly Wellborn, Policy Director for the ACLU of Nevada, testifying in support of SB 164. Thank you, Senator Scheibel, for bringing this important legislation. The ACLU Nevada is firm in our position that full decriminalization of sex work is the best policy to protect the health, safety, and welfare of both victims of sex trafficking and consensual sex, sex workers. But most of us can agree that prosecuting sex trafficking victims is a grave injustice and we must do whatever it takes to end this practice. Policymakers should listen to what victims say is necessary to improve their health and well-being. And that does not include an arrest record. Instead, the state should adopt policies that limit unwanted law enforcement presence and adopt holistic legislation. The ACLU of Nevada looks forward to continuing this conversation with Senator Scheibel and the stakeholders you're hearing from today. We encourage your support. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits, 202, please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes to speak and may begin. Yes, thank you, Majority Leader Canizaro and distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. For the record, I'm Jason Guanasso, G-U-I-N-A-S-S-O. I'm an attorney for AWAKEN and for the Rebecca Charleston Law and Advocacy Center for Survivors of Sex Trafficking. I've provided pro bono legal services to survivors of sex trafficking in various legal t contexts for nearly 10 years, including crisis legal services, restorative legal services, and services to provide survivors with an opportunity to hold their traffickers accountable by bringing civil actions. I support the policy objectives of SB 164 with the conceptual amendment uh, described by Senator Scheibel. Survivors of sex trafficking are not criminals, and they should not be treated like criminals by law enforcement and our judicial system. Victims of sex trafficking should be provided with support services, while law enforcement focuses on arresting the buyers and traffickers, and our legal system holds those buyers and traffickers accountable for their crimes. I'd really like to commend Chair Scheibel for her good faith efforts to work with a diverse coalition of people, stakeholders, and organizations who want to end sex trafficking in Nevada, care for and support survivors of sex trafficking, and enact laws that target buyers and traffickers. I especially appreciate the effort she has made to make amendments that will focus the policy on what is best for survivors. She chose to lead, to listen, and to take action and collaboration with all Nevada stakeholders who want to implement survivor-focused law and policy. Thank you, Majority Leader. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits, 144. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Then slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes to speak and may begin. Hello, my name is Alexa Foster, A-L-E-X-A, -E Foster, F-O-S-T-E-R, and I'm a survivor of sex trafficking. I wanted to share a brief testimony with y'all. I was raised in a middle-class family by parents who went to an Ivy League school. I was exposed to alcohol and not pornography at the age of 12, and I was also molested. When I was 17, I was intimidated into moving in, to moving out of my parents' house, and I was sex trafficked for over a year. I had my 18th birthday enslaved to my pimp. While under control of my trafficker, I was involved in three prostitution things. In total, I have six charges related to prostitution on my criminal record. I was coerced into giving false testimony regarding charges made against my pimp. He was only arrested in one sting, and his charges were ultimately dropped because of my testimony. I've been away from my trafficker for over a decade, and my criminal record still haunts me. It prevents me from getting certain jobs, and it has made it impossible for me to live in certain neighborhoods. 
This bill being passed is very important to me because arresting and prosecuting trafficking victims does not help them. Trafficking victims get coerced by their pimps so they will not testify. Because of this fear that trafficking victims face, prostitution charges will never be able to serve their purpose to end sex trafficking. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the last three digits, 106. Please press star six to unmute yourself, then slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes to speak and may begin. Hello, my name is Emily Driscoll, E-M-I-L-Y-D-R-I-S-C-O-L-L. Uh, I live in Senate District 3, Assembly District 10. I'm testifying in support of AB 164. Um, I am a law student, a uh, single mother, and a sex worker, and um, it's important to our community. I just want to say that it's important to our community uh, to take care of the most vulnerable among us. Trafficking is incredibly harmful to, uh, to Nevada, and current Nevada law harms people who are victim victims of trafficking while inadvertently protecting pimps. Increasing criminal penalties for trafficking puts victims at risk for being implicated as traffickers as law enforcement and our courts do, do not always understand the nuance of trafficking. Trafficking victims deserve the chance of not only uh, an affirmative defense to their charges being dismissed, but also the chance to avoid arrest, the stigma and trauma of further victimization by their traffickers and pimps and our criminal justice system. SB 164 will provide victims with substantive resources to escape abusive situations while avoiding the cost and lifelong impact of criminal proceedings against them. I yield my time. Thank you, caller. And with that, Vice Chair, there are no more callers to give support testimony at this time. All right, we will move to opposition on Senate Bill 164, um, and we'll take testimony now for those who are in opposition to 164, and we're gonna turn it back over to broadcast to go ahead and get us started with opposition. Thank you, Vice Chair Canizaro. We're currently on opposition testimony for Senate Bill 164. If you'd like to provide opposition testimony at this time, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, we are currently on opposition testimony to Senate Bill 164. If you'd like to provide opposition testimony at this time, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 745. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes to speak and may begin. My name is Lieutenant William Matchko, W-I-L-L-I-A-M-M-A-T-C-H-K-O. Chair Scheibel and members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, um, I supervise the Southern Nevada Human Trafficking Task Force and the Child Exploitation Task Force for Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Thank you for allowing me to participate in this extremely important matter. I want to especially thank Chair Scheibel for continuing to work with LVMPD and our stakeholders. And whereas we are opposed to the bill in its current form, we hope to be able to come to a position of support. In response to the previous statistics on the prosecution of sex trafficking and pandering, the main reason the successful prosecutions are so low is because the victims uh, many times do not cooperate with the prosecution. In this situation, we as a community need to look for the resolution. And this may be, the Senate bill might be that path. This prosecution cannot be forced upon law enforcement. If we are serious about updating legislation, we should make sex trafficking and pandering a state crime. 
Under the original language of this bill, if sex traffickers become aware that officers are required to release prostitutes when they are report being victims of sex trafficking, they will manipulate this law to their advantage. Suspects who are not actual victims will create false reports so they can be released from custody to work the streets again. And actual victims of sex trafficking will be released back into the hands of traffickers instead of being removed from the situation and have the potential to receive services. We feel that this will increase the amount of sex trafficking victims that will flood our state and the surrounding areas. Further, the language of determining a reasonable victim of sex trafficking is an extremely specialized investigation. Expecting police officers to be trafficking experts uh, places an unreasonable standard upon an already overburdened police officer. We have received a concept conceptual amendment and are still working our way through the language, which may alleviate some of our concerns of which are that sex, traffic sex traffickers often employ a trusted co-conspirator referred to as a bottom. The duties of this hired muscle, must, uh, the duties of this hired mu uh, muscle include recruiting, accounting, trans transportation, and beating of other prostitutes under the trafficker's control. This way, the trafficker does not have to get his hands dirty. By setting this, by setting this precedence, all co-conspirators will be given immunity from their crimes due to following orders. The language in this bill in includes victims of pandering with victims of sex trafficking. I want to make it clear that a victim of pandering is not being forced into sex work, whereas a victim of sex trafficking is being forced into sex trafficking. These two victims are not facing the same consequences and should not be viewed in the same way. Under the current language, if a prostitute is, convic is convinced by a roommate to work to pay the rent, this prostitute becomes the victim of pandering and sex trafficking. Now, if while, they, while this prostitute goes on a date, they commit a crime against the John, the prostitute would have immunity from the crimes committed. To conclude, while we are opposed to this bill at the current time, we are hopeful that we can move to a position of support. We are dedicated to effectively combating sex trafficking as well as reducing the trauma experienced by sex trafficking victims. We are committed to partnering to partner um, to supply the victims with resources they need in order to get away from their sex traffickers. Thank you once again, and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to field them now or after a hearing. Thank you, Thank and you we'll caller. continue with opposition testimony since we don't take questions during testimony. Thank you, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Brock, as I mean to cut you off. We can go ahead with opposition testimony. Thank you, Vice Chair Canizaro. No apology necessary. Uh, if you've just joined us, we're currently on opposition testimony for Senate Bill 164. If you'd like to provide opposition testimony at this time, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 389. <clears throat> Excuse me. Caller with the last three digits, 389. Please press star six to unmute yourself. And slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes to speak and may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Scheibel, Leader Canazaro, and members of the Senate Judiciary Committee. My name is Jennifer Noble, J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R-N-O-B-L-E, -E -E, and I am testifying today on behalf of the Nevada District Attorneys Association in opposition to AB 164. But I want to thank Chair Scheibel for her willingness to tackle this issue and to include us in these important conversations. Uh, while we do like the description in part one of the conceptual amendment regarding the coordinator's purpose and tasks, uh, we believe any recommended changes should be vetted through the ACAJ before they would become effective. We're also concerned about exempting uh, persons from criminal liability regarding a pretty wide variety of crimes without requiring a clear nexus between the crime committed and the victim's experience as a trafficked person. We also share Leader Canazaro's concern about unintended consequences that could arise when we create a separate duress affirmative defense that's specific to trafficking victims. To Senator Hansen's question, I'd also note that as prosecutors, one of our biggest obstacles in prosecuting sex traffickers is the insidious and effective dissuasion of victim survivors by traffickers that occurs prior to trial. They apply victims with drugs, intimidate them, hide them, help them leave the jurisdiction, I hope that stakeholders who testify today in support of this bill, including our defense bar, might also consider the possibility that removing impediments to prosecution of, 
uh, sex traffickers who keep the victims from testifying and increasing the penalty for dissuading the trafficking victims might be an option in working to end this epidemic. But we look forward to continuing the conversation moving forward and to working with all stakeholders toward a bill that we can all support. Thank you. Thank you, caller. And with that, Vice Chair, there are no more callers to give opposition testimony at this time. And we will move on to testimony in the neutral position. If you're here to give neutral testimony, and now is the time to do so, and we'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Vice Chair Canizaro. We're currently on neutral testimony on Senate Bill 164. If you'd like to provide neutral testimony at this time, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, to give neutral testimony on Senate Bill 164, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 468. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes to speak and may begin. Good afternoon, committee members. My name is Carlene Helbert, C-A-R-L-E-N-E-H-E-L-B-E-R-T, and I'm a deputy city attorney with the city of Las Vegas. My testimony today is limited to simply seeking clarification on the phrase capacity as a victim of human trafficking as set forth in section one, part 3B on the original bill and on part two, section one on the conceptual amendment. As this committee is aware, certain crimes are more commonly and directly associated with human trafficking victims than others. However, when dealing with crimes other than solicitation and prostitution, it can be a bit unclear what the capacity as victims of human trafficking means. We are seeking clarification on whether other crimes that may be entitled to dismissals are limited to those done during the victimization period. Is it any crime done during this time, or is it limited to those done at the direction or implication of the trafficker or pimp? The conceptual amendment includes having acted under duress in the course of being trafficked in the section dealing with affirmative defenses. However, the phrase capacity as a victim of human trafficking is used in the section involving dismissals so we are unclear if this distinction is purposeful. We are not taking a position on the language, but are just seeking clarification so that we can properly apply the law should it pass. Thank you. Thank you, caller. And with that, Vice Chair, there are no more callers to give neutral testimony at this time. Thank you so much for facilitating our public comment. Appreciate it very much. Um, Chair Scheibel, I will give you the floor for any last words that you may want to share with the committee before we close the hearing. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Canizaro, uh, Melanie Scheibel, for the record. As always, I want to thank everybody for their attention and participation in today's hearing. I really appreciate everybody who's come to the table and offer testimony, ask questions, and been involved. And I just want to reiterate my um, sincere commitment to continuing to work with all the stakeholders, those who called in to testify, those who didn't, those who I have yet to discover, I am committed to working with in order to make sure that we pass a piece of meaningful legislation that helps to end, uh, or just at least to decrease the human trafficking crisis here in Nevada. And thank you again for your time. And also I would um, welcome any members of the committee or anybody who's listening to reach out to me personally if they have questions or feedback or want to talk more about the bill. Thank you, Chair Scheibel. We appreciate you being here in your committee to present your bill. Uh, and with that, we'll close the hearing on Senate Bill 164. And I'm going to turn the meeting back over to you, Chair. Well, thank you so much. Um, and with the conclusion of that hearing, we have only one thing left on the agenda, which is public comment. If broadcast could let me know whether there's anybody ready to give public comment, um, they'll have two minutes per person. Thank you, Chair Scheibel. If you'd like to provide public comment this afternoon, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Once again, we're currently on public comment, and if you'd like to provide public comment this afternoon, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. And Chair Scheibel, the phone lines are open and working. However, there are no callers to give public comment at this time. All right then, thank you for your help. Thank you again to everybody who participated in today's meeting. 
Um, we will be meeting again tomorrow at the same time, 1 p.m. Until then, we are adjourned.